Make a noise if you're here. Welcome to Hair of the Werewolf. I'm Chase, and I'm here with my co-host, Lily. Hey, guys. We are a supernatural horror podcast where we tell each other stories that are allegedly true and often have a few drinks along the way. So cheers to all of you who are joining us. What you heard at the beginning <laughs> was one of our special recordings from when we stayed at the Hotel Andalus, which last episode is is all about that, our on-location recording. Yeah. We're going to talk about more about what we captured and recorded and everything uh later in the episode when uh, i tell my stories and whatnot but uh that was <laughs> that was our rather unique and interesting take on <laughs> a possible frog in our room or something we had a haunted frog is what <laughs> happened um yeah no i have no idea what that was but it was our our big capture of the night so stay tuned for a Hotel Andalus postmortem. And if you're interested in that whole story, make sure to listen to the last episode where we tell stories about the hotel while we stay there. It was a pretty interesting episode, and mm-hmm. I was pretty drunk during it. Yeah, I think so, uh, we both definitely were. <laughs> yeah, it, talk about ghost food and everything like that. Yeah, so. we started the night pretty heavy, so yeah. whoops. <laughs> so what are we drinking today? So right now I am drinking Bosque Brewing Company, and it's their Scotch Ale. The Scotia? The Scotia, yeah. Yeah, so the other night we really wanted something to drink, but everything, you know, everything (laughs) still has abbreviated hours because, you know, the pandemic, everything's shorter. Mm -hmm. It was like 10 o'clock at night and we couldn't even go to the grocery store to just buy some beer. We wanted some beer. And then I was like, well, why don't we just stop by one of the breweries and maybe see if we could pick up some package while they're closing. And they were, they were awesome enough to still be open, even though they were closing everything down and sell us some beer. So I think we were definitely ambitious. We bought two packets and we didn't even drink. I think we drank like two cans that night. (laughs) And then we passed out. But I will say times are a little bit weird if you are bad at planning and you never have storage liquor in your house. Yeah, we don't have a collection right now. We're not We're getting ready to move. So we're trying to keep nothing in our house. So (laughs) if all of a sudden at like 10 at night you're like, man, I really want to drink, you're pretty much screwed. You're screwed. So we need to be a little smarter about this going forward. For sure. But anyway, before we get into today's episode, I wanted to talk about the movie we watched a few days ago. So we just recently rewatched Slither. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen Slither, but we saw it. It came out in 2006. It's a monster movie by James Gunn, the same guy who did Guardians of the Galaxy and all that. Came out in 2006. I think we saw it in like 2007. And neither of us were particularly excited at the time. But I think... I we just don't think we were mood. in the mood. Yeah. I don't think we were in the mood. I think we didn't even watch a movie that night, and our roommate was like, dude, we're totally watching this, and I just don't think it was right. So we weren't crazy about it, and I was always like, we have to rewatch this movie. I want to give it another chance. I didn't think it was going to take 14 years, but the <laughs> benefit to 14 years is it means it feels like a movie we had never seen before, because mm-hmm. I pretty much remembered nothing. Yeah, same. So, so I got to say, after the second rewatch, I love the movie. It's really funny. Uh, and Super it's just, funny. Yeah. I think everyone is acting is on point. Nathan Fillion is in it. And so is uh, Jenna Fisher <laughs> for a brief second. Oh, yeah. For the, you <laughs> Office fans out there. And guess what? She plays a receptionist there, too. She's she like the dispatch call. Uh, um, call or receiver or something like operator, that. Operator. The dispatch yeah. operator. Um, but yeah, we're huge Firefly fans. So Nathan Fillion's always been a big thing to us. Yeah. So it was really cool to watch it. But so it's it's funny, but it's also really gross. And I don't mean like true crime documentary gross. I mean like like funny icky gross yeah, you know like, like slime and goo and and monsters <laughs> and all the stuff that isn't really gross you you wouldn't want to touch it in real life but it doesn't make your stomach hurt when you watch it in a movie don't want to eat while you watch this if you're queasy like i am yeah because so. there's a lot of people eating a lot in this movie and not in an attractive way <laughs> Um, Not like your usual attractive eating movies. <laughs> but it's got yeah, but it's got lots and lots of little worms and infections. It's an alien invasion movie and it's got everything that you could want. Comedy, action. Yeah, it's really good. And so I highly recommend it. But the reason I wanted to bring it up, not just that we watch it, is it is currently streaming for free on Amazon Prime. Yeah. So any of you that got Prime, you should totally give it a shot. It's a great movie, and if you don't like it ten minutes in then sorry for wasting 10 minutes of your life. (laughs) I'm not sorry. You're (laughs) welcome. Totally not sorry. (laughs) So uh, anyway, now we should get to the story. So Lily, what do you have for me today? Okay, so we're going to start off with my story, and it is The Dybbuk Box. The what? 
Dybbuk. D-I-V-I-C-K? No, D-Y-B-B-U-K. It's a Jewish word. So it's not something that I would have commonly have known myself. But the Dibbit Box is very, very popular. All right. In the paranormal world. Never even heard of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so, so when I hear box, I'm thinking puzzle, and I'm thinking like Hellraiser when they have that like cube. Ah, like the Pandora box. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it was called. Maybe that's what it was called. I think it was something like that. Um, no, it's not necessarily that. It's actually a wine cabinet. It's a, oh. <laughs> it's a small little thing. Less interesting than yeah. a puzzle box. <laughs> All right, so already my... All right, all right, go for it. Yeah, okay. I'm really glad you're interested. Thank you for holding <laughs> <laughs> Unless I can drink the I wine, just, I don't care. I really know how to capture my audience. <laughs> Thank you for the confidence. Um, <laughs> the uh, So this story, remember, if you recall, in the episode that I did the haunted painting, The Hands Resist Them, mm-hmm. you know, the one that was like, it's cursed and you're not supposed to look at it, otherwise you'll have bad luck. Exactly. Yeah, that story came about when I was researching... The Dybbuk box. So that, do you remember how I was like, oh, I'll, I'll look into this. Oh, and then so this I, was the original story this, and then you walked away from it. <laughs> and then I walked away from it and then I'm, and now I'm back. So the reason why I walked away is because obviously I'd never heard of the hands system, but I had heard of the Dybbuk box. So I kind of got more excited over something I didn't know already. Sure. But anyway, I'm back to it now. Very excited to do it. And the reason why I'm here is because my friend Sonia, who I call Kat, my very, very good friend, she recently went to Las Vegas, and there is the Zach Baggins Museum. Do you remember who Zach Baggins is? I feel like I always have to refresh your memory, because you, you just... absolutely have to refresh my memory. <laughs> He's the host to... Um, One of those ghost, ghost things. Ghost Adventures, you is know, the really... Is he the guy whose, like, delivery style is so cheesy? It's very dramatic. Yes, <sighs> that's him. So he has a big... Zach Baggins. <laughs> he has a big museum, and it's got, like all the most popular haunted things that he's able to get. Like, not everything, obviously, but most of the ones that I'll be talking about, including the Dibbit box. And she saw it in real life. And after the story, if you don't already know the story, you'll know why that's a pretty big deal. She really saw it in real life? Yeah, she really did. (laughs) She said it really freaked her out. Mm. Yeah, I was impressed, though. I was like, hell yeah. I I don't even know what it is yet, but I'm kind of impressed that, like, a haunted artifact that one of our friends is like, oh, I saw it in the flesh or in the wood or whatever it's made of. Oh, yeah. And she saw many, many other things, which I will eventually cover as well. Uh, before I get into the actual stories or the hauntings, I should mention, since you don't know, what Dybbuk means. It comes from Jewish mythology that literally means to adhere or cling. But more specifically, it refers to a soul or a dead person that can possess things and people. This soul is not at peace, so it kind of, the reason why it wants to attach to someone is to is to finish their business, and they can't do that, so their soul is always kind of like unrest. This is called a transmigration, and it's a belief in the Jewish faith, so it's something that, it, that is true, that's real. There are interpretations of the Dybbuk as literally being demonic, so it depends on your interpretation, and of course, in this case, a lot of people consider it to be demonic. Hmm. For you history nerds out there, the term can be dated back to the 16th century when it was when it first appeared in writing, but it wasn't made popular until S. Ansky, or his real name is Schloim Zanville Rappaport. Uh, good old Schloim. Schloim. God, I don't know his name. <laughs> wrote the play uh, The Dybbuk around 1913, so that's when it really got traction. That's when As, people started to take notice of it. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, for sure. So this story... Specifically, the Dibbit box comes from an original eBay posting that I was able to find <laughs> the full transcript to. It has a full story of how he got it, what happened to him and his family, and even has a few updates about the questions that was most frequently asked from potential buyers. So, I'm torn right now because when you said the word eBay, yeah. <laughs> I'm just getting this vibe of like a horror movie that was made in the last 10 years, you know, like... Facebook is haunted, and you get something <laughs> crazy on eBay. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of those out there, actually. Uh, eBay is becoming, if not already, definitely a huge hotspot of purchasing haunted artifacts. Well, I sell a lot of things on eBay. That's kind of like one of my side hustles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> I have never intentionally sold something haunted. If it was haunted, I didn't know about it. No, usually people like to disclose these kind of things. So yeah. you actually purposely look for haunted items like a doll or you know whatever and mostly what i sell is like comic books and video games 
if any of those are haunted, that's just really weird. I don't know. I did that Polybius. Polybius. <laughs> oh, what Polybius? is it? Polybius. <laughs> The uh, haunted sorry. Mario Kart. You don't know what's out there. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so, I'm actually going to be reading from the transcription directly most of the time, but I also have some side notes that I felt like I needed to look up and confirm or just sure. get more information about. So, you'll see what I mean. Um, his name, so the guy that had originally received the Dibbit box, his name is Kevin Manis, and this is his story. He says, During September of 2001, I attended an estate sale in Portland, Oregon. The items liquidated at this sale were from the estate of a woman who had passed away at the age of 103. A granddaughter of the woman told me that the grandmother had been born in Poland, where she grew up, married, raised a family, and lived until she was sent to the Nazi concentration camps during World War II. She was the only member of her family who survived the camp. Her parents, brothers and sisters, husband, and two sons and a daughter were all killed. She survived the camp by escaping with some of the other prisoners and somehow making her way to Spain, where she lived until the end of the war. I was told that she acquired a small wine cabinet. I purchased the wine cabinet along with a few other items. After the sale, I was approached by the woman's granddaughter who said, I see you got the divot box. She was referring to the wine cabinet. I asked her what a divot box was, and she told me that when she was growing up, her grandmother always kept the wine cabinet in her sewing room. Which, by the way, sounds like she was just totally... <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> going do some stitching and get some my wine on? <laughs> She's like, anyway, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> Arts and crafts is code for getting hammered. <laughs> um, so, yeah, she says, um, yeah, kept it in the sewing room. It was always shut and set in place that was out of reach. The grandmother always called it the dibbit box. When the girl asked her grandmother what was inside, her grandmother spit three times through her fingers <laughs> and said... <laughs> A divot box, uh, no, a dibic and a casellum. The grandmother went on to tell the girl that the wine cabinet was never, ever to be opened. So, grandma hawks some loogies, and that's considered appropriate behavior? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I think if I ask anyone any question under the sun, anything at all, and they spit three times, I'm going to be like, I need to leave. You're like, no, I'm good. I'm, I don't even know, I don't even care what they're going to say. I think they're crazy now. Yeah, uh, totally insane. <laughs> Completely. Yes. What do you want to eat tonight? <laughs> 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 uh, dare you I'm ask out. Me. I'm out. <laughs> um, so, the granddaughter, uh, so this is back to the story. <laughs> I still can't get over. <laughs> Grandma Loogie. Uh, oh my god. Bleh. All right. So, the granddaughter told me that the grandmother had asked about that the box be buried with her. So that was her request. However, as such a request was contrary to the rules of Orthodox Jewish burial, the grandmother's request was not honored. I asked the granddaughter what a divik and a kesselum were, but she did not know. So he asked again. He's like, damn it, woman, <laughs> tell me what it is. <laughs> what does a shlieb do? <laughs> um, I asked her if, she, if I can open it. She did not want to open it. As her grandmother had been very emphatic and serious when it when she gave the instructions to not do so. Okay. I finally ended up offering to let her keep it since it seemed like a very sentimental uh, keepsake. At that point, she was very insistent and said, no, 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 you bought it. I explained that I didn't want my money back and that it would make me feel better if she just held on to it as an act of kindness. She then became somewhat upset looking back now and the way she became upset was just plain odd. She raised her voice to me and said, you bought it, you made a deal. When I try to speak, uh, <laughs> I know I'm like, Ugh. This is uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. When I try to speak, she yelled, we don't want it. She began to cry, asked me to leave, and quickly walked away. I wrote the whole episode off to stress and grief she must be experiencing. I took the purchase and politely left. I think he's beyond polite at this point. Yeah, though. this is beyond the act of kindness, in my opinion. <laughs> and first of all, I think at this point, I certainly would have just walked around the store and been like, anyway, I'm just going to keep browsing and then leave the box and run the hell away. But he clearly has never seen a horror movie, so he goes on. Oh, uh, but let's <laughs> be fair, because we've learned how some of this horror stuff is, maybe since he made an arrangement to buy and exchange money, it's going to haunt him no matter what. Like, he'd get home and it would just appear. Ew. I mean, I doubt he has a sewing room, but it would appear in whatever <laughs> his hobby room was, right? Like right next to the television or DVD player or something. Yeah, that could make sense for sure. <laughs> this DVD player. Oh, this was in 2000. So the eBay post was in 2003. I don't know how long he had it. I can't remember. But that's prime DVD time. <laughs> prime prime TV, DVD. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, at that time, when I bought the cabinet, I owned a small furnishing business. I took the cabinet to my store. I put it in the basement workshop where I intended to refurnish and give it to my mother as a gift. I didn't think anything more about it. I opened my shop for the day and went to run some errands, leaving the woman, leaving a young woman who did sales for me in charge. After about a half hour, I got a call on my cell phone. The call was from my salesperson. She was absolutely hysterical and screaming that someone was in the workshop breaking glass and swearing. Furthermore, the intruder had locked the iron security gates and emergency exit, and she couldn't get out. Mm. As I told her to call the police, my cell phone battery went dead. I hit speeds of 100 miles per hour getting back to the shop. When I arrived, I found the gates locked. I went inside and found my employee on the floor in the corner of my office sobbing hysterically. I ran to the basement and went downstairs. At that point of the stairs, I was hit by an overpowering, unmistakable odor of cat urine. There had been never any animals in the store, he says. As I investigated, I found that the reason the lights didn't work also explained the sounds of glass breaking. All of the light bulbs in the basement were broken. All nine incandescent bulbs had been broken in their sockets and ten four-foot fluorescent tubes were lying shattered on the floor. I did not find any intruder. However, I should also add that there was only one entrance into the basement. It would have been impossible for anyone to leave without me head on. I went back to speak with the salesperson, but she had left. She never returned to work ever again. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, that one. So we don't even know what she saw. No, so she didn't. The it, I don't know. It seems like she didn't maybe see anything, but she just kept hearing. And that's what she said on the phone call. Like, she could only hear, hear people cussing and breaking things. And she kind of sure. just hid away. She was like, I'm not dealing with this. And called her boss. Um. Yeah. So at this point, Kevin had no idea what was going on. And it's definitely too early in the game to suspect a cabinet. Sure, right? <laughs> it's like, wait. You can't just, like, start thinking. Someone broke in, just- and I did get a new cabinet. <laughs> I know what's going on here. Transformer. (laughs) Transformer. So, um, yeah, he goes on to say that things got worse. As I already indicated, I had decided to give the cabinet to my mother as a birthday gift. After about two weeks, I made the purchase. I decided to get started on refinishing it. So this is finally the first time he opens it. Man, he didn't even open it after he bought it? No, I'm so confused. Look at people and spending money. It's crazy. (laughs) Well, I think it's like since it's his business, he just gets them. He's like, I'll f- they're like projects to him. He's like, I'm going to get it. I'll get to it eventually. I'm, I'm here doing business. I don't know. I shouldn't be like too judgmental because every <laughs> now and then I'd like buy a DVD or a Blu-ray or whatever on uh, Amazon. I'm like, ooh, this is a good deal. I can't wait to watch it. And then I'll get it and I won't find time to watch it. And then I'll find it six months later still in the shrink wrap. And I'm like, God, I suck. <laughs> yeah. And all this time it could have been haunted and you have no idea. <laughs> the haunted Blu-ray. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, yes, he finally opened it. He says, I was surprised to find that the cabinet has a unique little mechanism. When you open the door, the mechanism causes the opposite door and the little drawer below to open at the same time. So I was confused by his description. Oh, I, get, I get exactly what he okay, means. Okay, you do? A lot of mini bars do that, like where you open it and the whole thing kind of just yes. presents itself. So I saw a video of the cabinet, mm-hmm. and I guess what he means is when... Specifically with this design, if you open the thin bottom drawer at the bottom, the two top dro- uh, like doors open at the mm-hmm. same time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, this isn't a very strange mechanism for what it is because I learned that this type of cabinets are called Aaron Hakodesh. Um, these cabinets are found in synagogues, which are set up against a wall that faces eastward towards Jerusalem. And inside is where the scrolls of the Torah are stored. The design in which it opens is intentional because the idea is when you open it, you let the light fall equally onto the scrolls at the same time. Oh, that's a neat idea. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So there is significance. And this is kind of what I meant. Like I had to like look up why this cabinet did this. That would annoy the hell out of me. To, to me, but I was, this makes sense. To me, I was just picturing a mini bar and it has nothing to do with <laughs> light hitting all your alcohol at the same time. It's just so it looks pretty when you're just like, I'm about to get shit faced. So you can get to your <laughs> alcohol quicker. <laughs> There's so many choices. <laughs> Yeah, so that one at least has a, a like, ritualistic purpose, which I think is actually kind of nice. Exactly, it is. Um, So he says, um, it was made very well. Inside the cabinet, I found the following items. One 1928 U.S. wheat penny, one 1925 U.S. wheat penny, one small lock of blonde hair bound with string. Okay, that's messed up. One small... 
lock of black slash brown hair bound with string, one small granite statue engraved with gilded uh, and gilded with Hebrew letters. I was told that the letters, I was told later, he says, that the letters spelled out shalom, one dried rosebud, one golden wine cup, one very strange black cast iron candlestick holder with octopus legs. I saved all the items in the box intending to return them to the estate. The family has refused to the items, so they will be included in the estate in the sale of the cabinet. So he's describing again, like, obviously this is an eBay post. After opening the cabinet, I decided to not refinish it. I cleaned it and rubbed it with some lemon oil. It was at this time I noticed that there was an inscription in Hebrew carved on the back of the cabinet. I have no idea what it says or its significance, so... Back to my notes, I found out what it was. It is a Shema prayer, which is one of the first prayers that's learned and often, if not always, recited at least once a day. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, he goes on to say, On my mother's birthday, October 28, 2001, my mother called to tell me that she was going out of town with my sister, so we couldn't celebrate her birthday and couldn't give her the gift until October 31st, 2001. My mother came to the shop. We were going to have lunch together, but... Before we were going to leave, I gave her the wine cabinet. She seemed to like it. While she examined it, I went to make a phone call. I hadn't been out of sight for more than five minutes when one of the employees came running to my office saying there's something wrong with your mom. So this isn't in the description, but I saw an actual interview of Kevin's mom. Her name is Ida, by the way. And she said, and this was her experience. When she was left alone with a cabinet for the first time, she said that as she was looking at it, she felt like the cabinet was looking back at her. Mm. She got up from her chair, reached out, and, you know, was touching the cabinet, kind of looking at it. And as soon as she opened the door, she said that she felt a cold breeze coming out of it. She then began to stumble backwards and sat back in the chair. She felt paralyzed and was unable to get away or run away. All she can do was feel the pure terror coming out of the cabinet. She then, she also said that she started feeling like her mouth contort. And at that moment, she knew she was having a stroke. In those last moments, thinking that she was probably going to die, all she kept saying is, I can't believe I'm not going to see my son again. He's only a few feet away in the basement. And more importantly, I can't believe I won't be able to tell him to get rid of the box. That's what she said. Oh, that's... Uh, (laughs) Oh, that's messed up. I know. It's creepy. <laughs> so. That's really creepy. <laughs> For those two, your last thoughts. Yeah. I wish I could see my son and I need to tell him to get rid of this devil thing. Yeah. Like she's like, this is the worst. So back to Kevin's story. When I went back to see what was the matter, I found my mom sitting in a chair beside the cabinet. Her face had no expression, but tears were streaming down her cheeks. No matter how I tried to get her to respond, she would not. She could not. It turns out that my mother had suffered a stroke. She was taken to the hospital by ambulance. She ended up suffering partial paralysis and losing her ability to speak and form words, but she has since regained some of that. She could understand things being said to her and can respond by pointing to letters and the alphabet uh, to spell out words, you know, to communicate. When I asked her the following day how she was doing, she teared up and spelled no gift. I assured her that I had given her a gift for her birthday, thinking that I didn't remember, or thinking that she didn't remember, you know, because she had just had a stroke and blah, blah, blah. But uh, she became very, even more upset, and she began to spell out, hate gift. I laughed and I told her, I'm sorry, I I can get you something else, and um, that she didn't have to keep the cabinet. Still, I didn't associate anything that happened with the cabinet itself or anything paranormal. Frankly, I didn't think I ever used the term paranormal until that month. I'll try to make this uh, short now. <laughs> it's been it's been quite it's, the description. It's been quite the description. Um, I gave the cabinet to my sister. She kept it for a week, and then gave it back. She complained that she couldn't get to the door to stay closed, and that I kept opening. There are no springs in the door of the mechanism, and I have never found that the doors come open. I gave it to my brother and his wife, and they kept it for only three days and then gave it back to me. My brother said it smelled like jasmine flowers, while his wife insisted that it put an odor of cat urine. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. The cat pee comes back. We're, cu- we're coming back with the cat pee, yeah. I guess it was my girlfriend who asked me to sell it uh, for her after only two days. 
So he gave it to his girlfriend, I guess. Man, he's just giving it to everyone. Like, it's almost <laughs> like maybe people don't want this freaking <laughs> gift, dude. He's like, why doesn't my mom want it? Why doesn't my brother want it? Yeah, I don't know. So he says, I sold it the same day to a nice middle-aged couple. Three days later, when I came to open the shop for the day, I found the cabinet sitting at the front doors with a note that read, this has a bad darkness. I had no idea what that meant. Anyway, I ended up taking it home. That's when things got even worse. (laughs) I'm sorry. At this point, I'm I'm not feeling bad for him anymore. He is oblivious. He's totally oblivious. He has no idea what's going on. I mean, I don't. I don't know. It doesn't seem like he's very superstitious, obviously. So I don't think he's putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that things can be cursed. You know, or supernatural. Or maybe it's just a crappy cabinet. Just put it on the curb and say, free, <laughs> take me. Someone will surely take it. <laughs> and make sure to put it not on the curb in front of your house. Put it like on the curb in front of like some other business. So oh my that God, so messed up. No, but the thing is, at that point, it's not going to come back to you. And then if someone returns it to that curb, someone else will take it. And then it'll just be a juggling act from people who want free stuff. Yeah, that's that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Pass on the curse, yo. Yeah, it's not as easy consciously, but maybe for you. I, under, as- I understand how immoral that sounds. Yeah. But at some point, I was like, I don't want it. Yeah, no, for sure. Never gift you anything, I guess. Because <laughs> who knows? Anyway, um, he says that since that day I brought it home, I began a strange recurring nightmare. Every time I have the horrible dream, it goes something like this. I find myself walking with a friend, usually someone I know well and I trust. I find myself looking into their eyes of the person that I am with. It is then that I realize that there's something different, something evil looking back at me. At that point in my dream, the person I am with changes into what can only be described as the most gruesome, demonic-looking hag that I have ever seen. This hag proceeds then to beat the living tar out of me. (laughs) (laughs) I have awakened numerous times to find bruises and marks on myself. Oh. Mm -hmm. Where I had been hit by the old woman during the previous night. Still, I have never related the nightmares to the cabinet, nor do I think I ever would have until the next step. If you have dreams that you're getting beat up and you wake up with bruises, there's a problem, dude. Yeah. Like, but even, I don't... even if there's no cabinet involved, something's wrong and you got to figure this out. Yeah. It's like, am I beating myself up? I mean, even if he doesn't it's believe really it. It's really hard to give yourself a bruise. I don't... I kind of give myself bruises all the time. Or maybe I'm haunted. Who knows? <laughs> all this time. <laughs> My haunted wife. I bruise like a peach, people. <laughs> but there are always weird things. Like, it'll be like a pinky-sized bruise, like, on the back of your knee. And you're like, how the hell did that happen? Yeah, like, that's it just true. comes from nowhere. Maybe I'm just haunted by a very small, weak <laughs> child. <laughs> like a tiny little angry rat. I can, like, <laughs> I can handle that. I'm not worried about it. Um, so, about a month ago, however, my sister and my brother and his wife came over to my house and spent the night. The following morning during breakfast, my sister complained that she had a horrible nightmare. She said that she recalled having it a couple of times before and went on to describe my nightmare exactly to the last detail. My brother and his wife froze as they listened and then they chimed in that they had both had the exact same dream. Oh. Yes. The hair was standing on the back of my neck and still is. As he talked, it became clear that the common denomination was that each of us had that nightmare during the times that the cabinet was in our possession. I called my girlfriend and asked if she could recall having any nightmares recently. She described the same nightmare, same hag, everything. When I asked her if she remembered the dates in which she had the nightmare, but she didn't. Then I asked her if it happened to be the night before she gave me the cabinet back for her to sell. She said, yeah, how did you know that? So she was able to recall. Mm -hmm. Why do I have a feeling the next thing is going to say, still, I didn't think there was anything wrong with the cabinet. (laughs) You know, because I'm an idiot. I'm still not convinced. And I'm just kidding. (laughs) I thought maybe we just ate some really bad food the other night or something. Yeah. Couldn't be the creepy cabinet everyone keeps giving me Maybe they have a really creepy cat. I don't know. So he goes on to say, now then, since my family's discussion, it seems like all hell is breaking loose. For a week afterwards, I started seeing what I can only describe as shadow things in my peripheral vision. In fact, numerous visitors to my house have claimed that they have seen these shadow things. I put the cabinet in the outside storage unit and was awakened when the smoke alarm in the unit went off in the middle of the night. When I went to see what was burning, I opened the door and didn't see any smoke. However, I did get hit with the smell of cat urine. Mm. When I went back inside, the smell was there in my house. I do not own a cat, and I never have, he says. 
I went back outside and grabbed the cabinet. I brought it back inside and tried to research it on the internet. Why? Why? I don't know. I think it was... I don't know. I have no idea. If he, if he was like, I don't want to set up the smoke alarm again, then disable your smoke alarm. Why bring this cursed thing into your house? He's like... <laughs> You're better next to me, he's, where I can keep my eye on you. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely bringing the fire with him, so I don't know. <laughs> you crazy little cursed <laughs> thing, you. Oh, my God. Let's look you up. Um, I love how all these stories involve people who I just want to... See, maybe horror movies are not wrong. We always see horror movies and we're like, God, that guy's doing something stupid. Apparently, in real life, <laughs> people do the same stupid stuff, so maybe we need to take it a little easy on horror movies. Just saying. Yeah, what was that movie? Um, Contagion or something like that? Where people are like, that's not how people actually act in a like kind of pandemic or when when there's what like you a mean, d- outbreak. No, it was outbreak, but there was also another movie that people kept talking about to like watch because it was eerily similar how people behaved during like a crisis. Oh yeah, situation because like Contagion's that. a movie about a girl turning into a zombie. No, that's contracted. Oh, that's contracted. Maybe it is Contagion. Yeah. All these similar name movies. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. Um. Anyway, moving on. So. He says, yeah, so he started looking on the internet, and he says, I fell asleep (laughs) while surfing on the web. (laughs) (laughs) He just got stuck on Baby Shark and just... (laughs) He's like, YouTube is a black, black hole. No, he says, um, he had the same freaking dream. I woke up around 4.30 a.m., which felt and smelled like someone was breathing on my neck. To find that my house now smelled like jasmine flowers, and just in time to see a huge shadow thing go lopping down the hallway away from me. I would destroy the thing in a second, except I really don't have any understanding of what I may or may not be dealing with. I am afraid, and I do mean afraid, that if I destroy the cabinet, whatever it is that uh, that seems to come with the cabinet may just stay here with me. So he thinks like if he releases yeah. it. Now see, that's the first smart thing he said. Right. Yeah. And I think this came after he started researching about it. I, I'm also a little sad because the smell of jasmine flowers, I think, is kind of a nice smell. Not what khaki, a- <laughs> but jasmine's kind of nice. So all of a sudden, I'm like, is jasmine supposed to be a bad smell? Because I thought it was nice. No, I just think it's kind of like oh, another eerie side effect. Okay. Happened, you okay. know coming out of nowhere i think that's too much of a gamble for me i mean i love jasmine but i don't want to sometimes have the cat urine come with it so 50 <laughs> 50 i'm okay with not having it <laughs> calvin any of klein's it. worst <laughs> fragrance it might smell like bad and it might smell great it's your call oh god it's like kind of reminds me of like those harry potter jelly beans or whatever oh yeah the, there's some that like tastes like vomit yeah ugh. i think Pop- earwax and like the popcorn one was awesome though yeah i don't know i tried one and then i was like i'm good Anyway, so here we go. He says, I have been told that there are people who shop on eBay that understand these kinds of things and specifically look for these kinds of items. If you are one of these people, please, please buy the cabinet and do whatever you do with these kind of things. Help me. Uh, You can see that I have no reserve price or minimum bid. If I can make things any easier, let me know and I will do everything within my ability. Uh, The measurements to the cabinet, so in case you're curious, I said it was kind of small. It's like 12.5 inches by 7.5 inches by 16.25 oh, inches. Tiny. It's very small. Yeah, it is. So, yeah, he kind of has some updates on questions that were asked frequently. He did say that he's not religious and that um, he does not wish to participate in any kind of exorcism. And he will not be uh, selling individual items. So, you know, how, like there were things inside oh, of it. Oh, yeah, like so the he octopus says, candlestick. Right. Like he said, he's like, it's the whole, it's a whole bag. And uh, he doesn't know any of what the Jewish words mean. So he kind of confirms that he's like, no idea what's going on here. And that whoever purchased the piece, like he'll be willing to communicate with them and say, oh, yeah, like I'll tell you all the other stories that you need to know. Or if you have any other questions, like he's more willing to like work with this person because he really, really wants to get it out of his house. And so that is, let's see, I'm trying to see you in his notes. Nope. I think that's basically all that he had so that was his posting and so what did it sell it did sell how much do we know i think i saw in an article so i didn't write it down <laughs> best i can do is tree fitty <laughs> tree fitty um he i think it was like 250 dollars or it's something like that it wasn't cabinet. bad at all yeah and uh yeah so again i didn't come across the buyer's name and i don't know if it's creepy to even try to find it so i didn't sure but the buyer eventually did give the box to his coworker or it was his coworker's roommate, whose name is Jason Saxton. So that is the person who currently has it. Or it's now in the Zach Baggins Museum, but at the time he owned it. Like he was the okay. second guy. Yeah, so yeah. 
Zach Baggins got it from this guy. Yeah, so he got it from that guy. All right, all right. Um, and he lived in Kirksville, Missouri. He says it himself, so I think he's okay with people knowing that. In an episode of Deadly Possessions, also hosted by Zach Baggins. <laughs> <laughs> that guy gets around, doesn't he? He really does. Yeah, I, I had no idea. Jason, for the first time in 12 years of owning the box, traveled to meet with Zach. So he had never taken it out of the state, not even out of his house, really, or his property. Uh, Jason tells a story that he says the first time he simply touched the box, he got really sick and began to vomit ectoplasm. Uh. I know, right? But he also says he had an unbearable stomach pain like he had been stabbed. His eyes began to bleed and he broke out in hives. So he was like a hot mess. I don't know why. For some reason, when I heard all the eBay posting, I'm like, ooh, that's creepy. I'm hearing this. I'm like, I don't know if I believe any of it. Yeah, he's really hardcore um, affected by it, I guess. At one point, the box became such a violent thing that he ended up burying it in his backyard inside a military box (laughs) for five years. So that's where it kind of was before. Uh, Like I said, oh, no, I didn't mention this. I don't know why I didn't mention this. So Kevin Manis had also agreed to be on this show, on this episode. Okay. So he finally did return back to the Dibbit box. Oh, and, so it, and it was in his presence? It was in his presence. So uh, this is what happened, yeah. Bad call, dude. <laughs> so first he was interviewed with Zach. And then afterwards, uh, Zach's like, hey, are you okay with seeing it? So he didn't just like put it in his face or anything. And uh, Kevin, I guess, was like, sure, I'll, I'll go look at it, whatever. So they go to, for whatever reason, was in the basement. <laughs> and he goes there. And they're like, okay, so we're going to leave you in the room alone with the box. And we're oh going to... Oh, my God. <laughs> And we're going to, like, film you and see if we capture anything. There, you know, Zach goes back to the control room, and he can see him on TV. And then not long after, or rather, as soon as Kevin opens the Dibbit box, the crew notices that the lights in the front museum part of the building starts to flicker. Uh, Then Kevin begins to say some weird shit that makes no sense in a weird voice. He said things like, I come to your dreams with a promise to keep the night to morning. I'll torment your soul. Kevin also began to hum and then breathe really weird, almost like he was hissing, laughing. That's what it sounded like to me anyway. Um, so going back to the what was the owner at the time, Jason Haxton, he also mentioned a story that just before he buried the box, he had it stored in the basement. His friend had come by and wanted to check it out. And when Haxton came back to check on his friend, he was found dead over the box. Really creepy. Wait, his friend was dead? Yeah. But I wasn't able to confirm the story, so I don't know. I don't know. I'm finding all this stuff very, all of it's hard to. It's so extreme. Well, and I even am now like wondering because if Zach Baggins, if I'm picturing the same guy that I think I am, (laughs) I think you're correct. I, I wouldn't trust him to, you know, do two plus two. So I would totally buy that they would pay him to put on an act to make the show look spicy. I'm not going to say he's not been accused in the past for dramatization or or rather um, making things up to kind of emphasize hauntings. So it's unfortunate because... Let's just because, say his baggins might be full of shit. You know, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst. Uh, yeah, we'll say that. So his friend is dead over the box. So his friend is dead over the box, and I think that's that was what made him bury the box. And then, yeah. So now it's at Zap Baggins Museum. So if anyone in Las Vegas, if anyone is interested, you can go see this amazingly haunted, creepy box. Now, I'm going to update you on some recent events. <laughs> okay. <laughs> recent-ish. So in 2012, uh, there was a movie called The Possession that is based off the Dibbit box. It has a pretty good cast. Um, the IMDb, though, gives it a 5.9 out of 10 and has a 48% audience rating. Not the best, but not the worst. Maybe we'll give it a shot. Maybe we'll give it a shot. Yeah. Um, Post Malone was at one point with Zach Baggins at the museum. While the two were in the room, Zach is seen. So I saw the video, by the way. Zach is seen touching the box, and then Post Malone hits Zach in a joking way on the shoulder. Now, for a second, when Post Malone touches Zach, Zach is still holding the box, and he described it like something transmitted between the two of them. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, hold on. Maybe Post Malone will sing a song about it. Uh, just like the clap, it was very contagious. Just kidding. No, I don't know. 
problem. Um, so I didn't cheat on you. I swear. I touched a, a cursed wine cabinet. Yeah, it's not me. So the rapper has claimed that since his visit to the Dibbit Box, he has experienced what would be described as being cursed. He personally attributes his series of bad luck to the Dibbit Box. And some of the things that happened to him within one month time frame, he was in a car accident. One of the planes that he was on almost crashed. His home was robbed. And I think that was it, the big ones. So he feels like that's no coincidence. Well, I do. I actually feel really bad for him. That is a bad string of no, luck. No, that sucks. sucks. Yeah. So I do feel really bad for him. So what I'm about to say is in no way meant to underplay how awful all that stuff is. Sure. But being a famous person who's involved in a lot of stuff, because I bet he's on, he's driving around a lot. He's doing a lot of activities. Like he's just going like to statistically, the if you're on the road more. And gonna... small planes, like private sure. planes, have a higher crash rating. And if you're rich, people are going to try to rob you. Those things might be just attributed to the fact that of, of his status and what he's doing. That really sucks that he has had all that stuff happen. Yeah, though, so. exactly. Um, again, so like you mentioned, kind of not trying to discredit his experience, but he is a hardcore believer. Um, he is mm. also a UFO watching enthusiast. Mm-hmm. Uh, while staying, I think we've even mentioned I think that we mentioned this. Episode. Yeah, because like in his Utah home, he'll often go out in the middle of the night and use his like, night vision goggles to, <laughs> to watch UFOs go by. Um, yeah, so that's his, that's his spiel. That's his experience. I also kind of hate, but I feel like I have to include this information. I found an interview of Kevin by Charles Moss with Input Magazine in 2021. He was quoted saying, uh, Kevin, the carvings in the back of the box are my carvings. The stone that was in the box, something that is a signature creation of mine. Make no mistake, I conceived of the divot box the name, the term, the idea, and wrote this creative story around it to post on eBay. Moss goes and confirms other details with Kevin's friends, and one of them admits that one of the locks of hair found in the box was hers. Hmm. Now, as a counterpoint, though, Jason Haxton, the one that I told you about, the second owner, he said that his experience were real, so he's still holding on to that. So he's not, like, he's not phased by what Kevin had said. In addition, this is the only interview that I found him countering his own interviews in the past. So I'm not saying that like this interview with the magazine is not true, Sure. but I can't say it's, it is true. Absolutely. I don't know. Does that make sense? Like if you see some videos with him, if you see written articles about him and even the interview with his mother, Ida, it was all very convincing or like, I mean, they were, she was crying and you know, she seemed very distressed and the stroke was real, things like that, that did happen. So I don't know. It feels like it's kind of back and forth all of a sudden now in 2021. Some very probable embellishment to make it seem more saucy than it is. Yeah. So it could have been both ways. Like maybe initially they did think something to the cabinet was real. They were very scared of it. And then as it gained traction, attention, maybe there was more embellishment. Mm -hmm. And now he's trying to counter a lot of the weight that he put on the divot box with this. But it's kind of like negating a lot of it too. And then there's also the notion that sometimes when people have strokes, it has... There's a lot that goes on. Sure. And, you know, what she had to deal with was really hard and really horrible. And there's a good chance she had a reaction to it. And it was just like she wanted anything to do with it. Cause mm-hmm. She had a stroke while she was looking at it. Right. And it became a, a sign or something that she hated about it. And then the guy's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this thing? And then people just started assuming, well, it's got to be cursed because she had a stroke. And then he's like, well, if I add all these stories, I can make it a haunted thing and get rid of it. Yeah. 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 Meaning it's not haunted at all. So possibly. very possibly. Yeah. Uh, there's so many possibilities on what's going on here. But a lot of people who go see it, including my friend, said that it was a very creepy experience. Like she felt anxious and like, you know, not wanting to, to look directly at it kind totally. of thing. And with those kind of things, especially if you're in a museum full of haunted items, that specifically giving you that reaction when it could have been anything is something to say. I don't know. So anyway... Here we go. That is my story. Well, but here's the big question. Would you be willing to go see it in Las Vegas? Oh, yeah, totally. I really want to go. I don't know if I am. (laughs) Okay. I want to believe that it's all just a hoopla fake story, but I'm still kind of creeped out about it. Still a little creeped out? Well, I mean, aside from the I might go if you hold me. Oh, well, (laughs) I'll try. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, I'll totally hold you. I'll hold your hand. I don't know if I can lift you. It'd be a pretty fun thing to do in, in Vegas, though, you know? 
There's, I mean, there's other things to do for sure. Well, I know, but this one isn't gambling, which I like. Yeah, very true. Although you're gambling with your soul, maybe. So, dun, I, had, dun, dun. so I had never heard of this story before, ever. Oh, really? It was it's really good, It's considered like the most haunted object in the world by many people. So uh, mm. There's a lot of things. There's the chair that people die on. Oh, yes. I think the chair where people die, that it, just by default has to be more haunted. Yeah. It might yeah, be yeah, creepy, yeah. but you got to kill people for it to become <laughs> the most haunted thing in the world. What was the, what was the chair called? Yeah, I can't remember, but it was a really good one. Anyway. So we should take a break. I've got the update on our Hotel Andalus stuff coming up right afterwards. We need another drink, so yes. we'll see you guys in a second. Woohoo. Okay, guys, we're back, and I think Chase has now finally our update on the Andalus, so I'll have you tell us that now. Absolutely. So if you missed last week's episode, we stayed at the Andalus for an on-location recording. So, so during the recording, we talked about history and some scary stories and everything, but we decided to go a little extra mile after we finished recording, and we wanted to do a little ghost hunting, mm-hmm. ghost adventure stuff ourselves. So we set up some equipment in an effort to capture some paranormal phenomena. Now, we don't have all the fancy equipment that professionals use, but that wasn't going to stop us from trying. We used whatever we had. So the first thing we did was we set up a microphone in an effort to capture some EVP or electronic voice phenomena. This involved uh, me turning my microphone sensitivity all the way to the max, and then I would put it you know, kind of in the center of the room, mm-hmm. made sure everything that we, could, that we had control over was quiet, and then we would ask questions and then pause and try to see if there was anything in the room that wanted to say anything. Yes. And the idea is that we might not even be able to hear what is being said, but the microphone might pick it up, and we have to, like, bring it onto the computer afterwards and modify it and everything. So the kinds of questions we asked would be, like, is there anyone in the room with us? (laughs) What is your name? Can you make a noise? Do you want us to leave? Things like that. The usual. The usual. You know, the kind that you really don't want to hear answers to for the most part. (laughs) So afterwards, I opened up the audio on my computer and enhanced it to amplify any sounds the microphone would capture. So, you know, you just crank it up. And the funny thing is we did hear, you could hear a lot more. Most of it was like obvious things that were going on in the background of the hotel or uh, uh, something driving on the street. We couldn't tell. Like we heard that stuff too. For the most part, we didn't hear anything. It was mostly silent except for just random background noises. But there was one moment... (laughs) It was weird (laughs) where we asked a question and when I enhanced it and all I did was raise the essentially just raise the volume. I didn't do any changes to the audio other than increasing the volume. What we heard was this. Make a noise if you're here. (laughs) So (laughs) it kind of sounded like a ribbit. (laughs) It totally sounded like a frog. Yeah. And I have no idea. Like, we didn't hear that when we were doing it. No. But when I increased it, I I have no idea what to make of that noise. <laughs> it sounds funnier than anything. Like, it doesn't scare me. I was just like, I wonder if it picked up, like, my foot on, like, the carpet. You know, sometimes carpet makes weird noises while right. maybe just a slight shifting of my weight. Or maybe it was even picking up our stomach, like, stomach sounds that we wouldn't normally yeah. hear or something. Maybe we're really hungry. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, what if it was like a neighbor farting and that was in the wall? <laughs> we have no idea. So you guys are hearing uh, either a a frog or a fart. <laughs> neighbor neighbor <I'm> fart. <laughs> but then we decided. <laughs> well, what I decided to do was whenever you watch these like ghost hunting shows, they always like run the sounds through filters and change the tempo and the pitch to try to make it sound. Um, more legible like if if it's a word that you hear saying they kind of do that on purpose but for the most part they're changing the sound so i usually roll my eyes but i was like well if they do it i'm gonna do it too (laughs) so what i did is i changed the pitch and slowed it down and this is what we got sounds more like a grunt like a little bit froggy though like it almost sounds like what from like a really deep voice going like what (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, but it's not really. It's a ribbit. Oh, right. <laughs> a ribbit or a fart that's just slower and deeper. Right. <laughs> so that's what we got. So at that moment, I would say we found nothing. But. Uh, yep. Basically, I think, unfortunately, that is the truth. Actually, in fact, I will say that from our past experiences, we always felt something. We always like saw something or heard something, too. And my theory is that we came in too desperate. I think we were mm-hmm. like really wanting it and the ghosts were like not having it. And we couldn't find anything. 
So the second thing we tried was setting up a camera with a time lapse to record the room while we slept. I set the camera up on a tripod and put it on a wide angle so I could capture the majority of the room. Mm -hmm. The room was kind of a weird setup, so our, our bed area was kind of an offshoot, but most of the room was just a long rectangle that we were able to capture. Yeah. I'd never done this before, so it had a high probability of not working out very well, and it didn't. Uh, the <laughs> biggest problem we faced was that the camera isn't a night vision camera. It's just a GoPro Hero. Yeah. Awesome little cameras, but it's not a night vision camera. So we kind of had to deal with whatever light it could capture. So that means the images that we got are very, very dark. I didn't want any lights on because in my mind, I figured ghosts prefer it in the dark which I don't think was the best choice in hindsight because in the morning I pulled the video and watched it again and again and I can safely say it captured almost nothing. Basically nothing. What I did get was a rough time lapse of the sunlight coming through the curtains as it rose in the morning. <laughs> and there were a few flashes of light from when we both went to pee in the middle of the night. We had drank a lot, so we had to go to the bathroom <laughs> more than a few times. We're not that old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to do it again, but I think maybe we need to set up a low level light, something that, you know, is dark enough that it won't be a problem, but it, the camera will still be able to pick up more than just a mostly black room. Right. So in all, I'd say those results were pretty disappointing. <laughs> it's it's nothing great. You just kind of see some light from the sun at the end of the video as it rises, but it's mostly black with you can see a couple things and nothing changes. I was hoping to see something cool, like some chick standing there, but obviously. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah. But well, I, some of the stories we did have, you know, women ghosts walking around. Yeah. So I'm going to point this out, though. Whenever you watch like ghost hunters and ghost adventures and ghosts, whatever they call them, they have like expensive equipment and oh, they yeah. set things up in places that are supposed to be some of those haunted places in the world. And we never get anything. They show us some orbs and then they show us some modified <laughs> audio that sounds like somebody saying ribbit. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, totally, we think they're ghosts. So I'd like to say that our results are aren't any worse than the professionals so i don't think we failed i think we did pretty good i think we can do better next time though well we're learning from next, our lessons so next, next year. on location whenever that is yeah However, oh next place yeah, yeah yeah we can do that too i did want to mention something interesting after we record the last episode we learned something because we were talking to our sister-in-law, Cindy, about the episode <gasps> after we recorded it. Right. And we found out that she used to work at the hotel. Yeah, we I didn't no even know. idea. What the hell? So she worked as what she she said she was a bartender there. And that was before it was rebranded as the Andalus Now. It was mm -hmm. at the previous name, which was the La Posada de Albuquerque. Yeah. Which was when everyone was talking about it being haunted. Mm -hmm. When we were talking to her, we mentioned that the hotel was allegedly haunted, and then she said, oh, it absolutely is haunted. I used to work there. And we're like, wait, what? <laughs> so when it was La Posada, the bar was in a different area. Right now, the bar is kind of a, on the second floor terrace. It's like an outdoor rooftop bar. Wonderful. Like one of the best bars in our downtown. But originally, it was in the lobby in the back towards the elevators. Very oh, hotel yes, feeling. Yes. So she said, you know, that's where she used to work. And you'd have to go behind the bar to get to the elevators as well as the back doors that allowed people to like restock and take out the trash. And mm -hmm. she said whenever she had to walk back there, whenever any of her coworkers had to walk back there, it was everyone felt like super morose. It was super creepy. It was a very uncomfortable thing. Yeah. And that made me remember there was that story of the guy who died in the elevators because he fell through the floor of the elevator down the shaft and died. I think it was a cleaning lady, wasn't but it? But that would mean right there at the behind the bar, that's the bottom of the elevator. That's where they would have been that's dead. That's where... Oh my God, that's right. That's where they would have died. Ew. So just something, you know, to think about. She also said, you know, without us even talking much about her episode, she said, oh yeah, the seventh floor is the haunted floor. <laughs> I don't oh, wait you must have talked to her more because I, I have talked to her more okay since then. I was not there when I she talked said to that. her more since then oh, okay and she said yeah that everyone would always have stories of a woman walking around the seventh floor all the time <laughs> oh my God. now she did say she stayed there one time in the 90s but she never had anything creepy happen to her oh, okay she said the rooms were definitely set up differently that after all the renovations are kind of a oh, different yeah. thing but yeah she was like no it's absolutely haunted it's creepy and we don't normally hear stories like this from her, so I, I was like, no. okay, I'm, there's a lot of credit to be given and here I that I like. And I definitely trust her. She's not the kind of person to like make stuff up. In fact, she hates this stuff. She's like, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. She's terrified. So Absolutely. the fact that this is something that she experienced herself is like, not something she's more than willing to admit, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And 
what she was telling us about it being uncomfortable areas and whatnot really goes in line with the guy who checked us into the hotel last time when we talked to him about the hauntings. He said, Mm -hmm. most people's experiences here have to do with feeling super uncomfortable and weird feelings in certain areas or at certain moments. It's not always or very rarely about seeing apparitions. So it seems to be that's kind of just the universal thing. Right. And then... Real quick, we had one last story that while I was, you know, trying to just get all my information in the clear, I found one last little story from the uh, book Haunted Albuquerque by Cody Polston. I thought this one was worth talking about. Ooh, okay. So this one was from a guest who allegedly stayed on the seventh floor. Now, as we mentioned last week, the two most haunted floors are the seventh and fourth floor. Mm -hmm. So seven tends to have the most activity. If you recall, that's where that one waiter was killed and murdered. He was like stabbed multiple times, scalped and had his (laughs) spinal cord cut. Oh, a totally normal murder, right? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> so apparently a lot of murders, mostly on the seventh floor, it seems like. So anyway, this guest was staying on the seventh floor. They were taking a shower when they saw what they described as a disembodied face. She brushed it Ooh. off as a figment of her imagination, like, oh, I'm just being crazy. So you know, <laughs> As we do. As we do. You know, oh, it's just a face. Uh, so what? she went about her day, and uh, she was staying with her boyfriend at the time. So she was trying to go to bed later that night. Her boyfriend was already sound asleep. Mm-hmm. And she became overwhelmed with a feeling that she wasn't alone in her room. She then spotted a woman in a pink gown farther in the corner of her room. The next part is quite horrifying because she said the woman glided towards the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one gave me creepy heebie-jeebies. Ew. Something about that word just had me picturifying, <laughs> picturifying, <laughs> picturing a terrifying image. Like, yeah. the idea of just seeing someone just, like, gliding towards you. <sighs> anyway. I'm like, uh, was, are while, you on roller skates? What's going on? I'm just kidding. <laughs> while the pink lady who shouldn't have been in their room was gliding towards her, it raised its arms and opened its mouth and began to make a moaning sound, <gasps> totally Hollywood style. Ew. Apparently, alarmed, she screamed, and it woke her boyfriend up next to her, who, surprise, surprise, couldn't see anything. Wait, like, was she still there? Could she still see her? So, or? that was not clarified. I think what happened is when oh. her boyfriend woke up and all the commotion, nothing could there be was, seen. It was gone. That's the oh. implication. However, okay. the woman did say her boyfriend fell asleep almost immediately afterwards, and she could hear a distant, creepy laughter as she was <gasps> trying to go to bed. What a bitch. Yeah. So it's a small story. Nothing major. But I found it while I was, you know, just finishing up this. And I was like, I thought it was good enough to tell you guys. <laughs> so there's that. I think it was very good. I so, liked it. Good hotel. I recommend staying there. I really do. Food's awesome. The bar's great. It's a beautiful hotel. And it's possibly haunted. So you can have some good stuff. Yeah. Just don't bring jewelry. Because there's that one ghost on the second floor that likes to move it around. And... They don't steal it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It's still weird. It is a little weird. Yeah. But I think that brings our episode to a close this week. If you have any stories that you want uh, us to know about, please hit us up at hotwpodcast at gmail.com or through any of our social media accounts. As always, we post episodes every Saturday, and you can find us on all standard podcasting platforms. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to keep drinking, and we hope you do too, or at least whenever you can responsibly. And of course, you guys, if you partied way too hard last night and you're not feeling very good, well, don't worry, because the best cure for a hangover is fear. Bye.